Hello and welcome to Labour Lens. I am Sharon Ijasson. The International Labour Organization celebrated its centenary anniversary some few weeks ago. For the next few weeks, we will be discussing about the issues that were raised at the Palais here in Geneva, Switzerland. We have interesting news stories for you. We will be right back. The program to honor the late Pengerson president, Francis Olabode Johnson, started with service of songs, which also included solidarity songs. Family members, friends and colleagues in the labor sector converged on Abuja to celebrate the life and time of Francis Olabode Johnson, popularly called F.O.J. But one good thing and assurance we have, and I've said this to the wife, and I've said it to as many people who have come to me, it's a word I find in Isaiah 57 and verse 1. Isaiah 57 and verse 1. It says, the righteous are taken away from the day of evil. Pengerson, which remained the conscience and voice of labor in the critical Nigeria oil and gas sector, plays the role of mirror of the society and constant voice of reason against repressive labor practice in the country. Colleagues in the sector spoke on how the late Pengerson president pursued negotiations and collective bargaining with international and local hoi companies as well as government to fight for workers' welfare. The morning that F.O. Johnson departed, these shoes will remain one of the darkest in the annals of trade unionism in Nigeria. And we have lost our finest, our best, and our very reliable leader. He unified the labor movement. It was a strong pillar of unity. If there's anything he left behind as a legacy, you know, it's a strong stand on unity of labor. Comrade Johnson tried as much as possible to bring everybody on board, to speak with everybody, or now we can move the Nigerian workers forward. I'll give him that. He's a bridge builder. Uh, is a man that we all need in building the synergy between Nupeng and Pengerson. The late comrade Francis Olabode Johnson served as president of Pengerson from 2014 to 2019. He contributed immensely to the growth and development of the association. As part of his drive to transform Pengerson, FOJ initiated the e-library projects and event resource centers in all the zonal offices of the union across the country. He was always very humble. He was honest, always ready to learn and to follow. And of course, ultimately, he became the leader which he was, a very reliable and faithful leader. Born on the 2nd of May 1960 in Lagos, Comrade Francis Olabode Johnson was a staff of the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, NNPC, until his death on 31st of May 2019. The president of the Medical and Health Workers Union of Nigeria, Josiah Biobo Lemuye, has urged the federal government of Nigeria to call its officials to other and direct them to negotiate openly the issue of consequential adjustments arising from the new national minimum wage. Millions of workers at the federal and 36 states public services. The union also wants the presidency to appoint ministers in the Ministry of Health and Labor to ensure industrial harmony. Nigeria should know that this minimum wage, 30,000 minimum wage, and the consequential adjustment that is not creating the issue, it just bought a very small amount. Level 7 officer, level 7 officer, under this consequential adjustment that we are asking for, is only getting additional 15,000 naira. After eight years of non-increase, after eight years of a stagnated salary, after eight years of a devalued salary after eight years of a, 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 a quasi-called salary you know people just asking for only 15,000 additional to a level seven officer and then somebody says it's too much you know what they are they, they are they're offering five thousand after eight years 
And we as labor, for clarity, for our workers to understand, we know that 15,000 Naira is not even enough. But we decided to step down to that 30% increase instead of asking for us um, standing firm on the 66.6% across board, which is the, between, the difference between the um, 18, 30,000 and 18. We did not stand there firmly because the government also now hinted or promised that after this, then soon we will take off into discussing a salary review for the public service. That's why we stayed. In 2018, Nigeria overtook India as a country with the largest number of people living in extreme poverty. This necessitated the need to engage governments to ensure that there are efforts towards ensuring ease of doing business and wealth creation in the country. We must continually think out of the box to support wealth creation initiatives, wherever it comes from. Therein lies the prosperity of our nation the tax of returning Nigeria to the path of economic prosperity is a collective effort and all hands must be on deck. We have entered into a collaboration with NECA. Section 1F of the Employees' Compensation Act of 2010 basically provides that we are to combine efforts and resources of relevant stakeholders with a view to preventing workplace disabilities and enforcement of occupational um, safety and health standards in the public and private organizations. The Director General of the Nigeria Employers Consultative Association, Timothy Olawale, spoke on the challenges the organized private sector is facing. There is a need for them to Take a second look at the reform in the private sector that has been done to ensure that if there is a need for review, to ensure that power sector thrives and deliver on their mandate to the, uh, to the public. Organized labor at the conference spoke on the need for NECA to engage government on how the economy can be improved and workers' welfare and job security in the private sector enhanced. The world. And I'm not talking about Nigeria now. From Oxfam records, shows that the world economy has tripled in the past few years. But the number of people poor across the globe have also increased, while the wealth of the world is increasing. We in TUC wish to urge NECA to discuss the issue meditating against the economy dispassionately publicly sparing none worthy of blame and taking pragma uh, pragmatic decisions to achieve desired objectives. Because the ILO is, is based on tripartism, uh, African representation or government representation is, all, is quite important as well. Uh, the African group has been quite largely historically supportive of uh, demands by the working group uh, and uh, we therefore we are able to support the African positions on that because we believe that their adequate representation will improve governance uh, of, of the ILO. Uh, so that has been quite important. But from the point of view of the working group, most, some of the things that have been most important to us have been, the, given the changes in the world of work, uh, how to ensure that workers' rights, fundamental rights, remain preserved, and that the work of the ILO will always be centered on the promotion of workers' rights. Generally, one, we agree that uh, innovation is the order of the day anywhere in the world both in developed and developing countries. But one aspect we just have to be careful is the issue of digitalization. Because if you draw a quick conclusion on digitalization, you may also be cutting short the expectation of Africa. A developing country, in as much as we agree that uh, the use of technology is quite apt 
in order to fast track and attain our expectation. We should also be mindful of the fact that whatever program we drive should be labor intensive because uh, we have unemployment challenge in Africa, especially in Nigeria. Unemployment problem will be better solved when more people are involved in driving programs. And that is why the use of people than robots is what I advocate for Africa. I agree with the world that uh, digitalization is coming, but I don't think it's coming to replace the work of man. On the profile interview segment this week, I will be speaking with the president of ITUC, who also doubles up as the Nigerian Labour Congress president, Comrade Ayuba Awaba. He spoke extensively on the future of work and what workers should expect across the globe from the International Labour Organization. Take a listen. It's good to have you on the program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations, ILO is um, 100 and it's celebrating a centenary celebration. As the president of ITUC, um, what has been the engagement so far? Well, I think uh, it's uh, actually uh, an occasion to celebrate the very wonderful works that uh, ILO have done over the past 100 years. Uh, you remember that ILO was formed uh, immediately after the First World War. Uh, to try to use uh, social justice to address and bring about peace around the world. And uh, from that period to now, uh, we can look at very tangible achievements of the ILO in the world of work, uh, particularly uh, the peace and resilience that was actually brought back to the entire world after the First World War. Uh, a lot of conventions and uh, also a lot of instruments uh, that have global application that have been used uh, to address issues of social justice, uh, issues of fundamental rights, uh, particularly some of the very landmark declaration, uh, the declaration of 1998, uh, a declaration of, on fundamental rights of workers at, right, uh, at work, and many, many other issues. Uh, issues of uh, gender, uh, issues of working hours, uh, issues of freedom of association and the right of a worker to collectively bargain are very pronounced. And uh, back at home, you remember it was through the work of ILO that Nigeria happened to be among the first countries in Africa to actually domesticate uh, the very core ILO conventions, nine of them. Uh, the Convention of Child Labor, uh, the Convention of Minimum Wage, Convention 131, uh, the Convention of uh, 98 on Freedom of Association, and uh, the Right to Collective Bargain Convention 87. All of those form part of the supervisory mechanism of ILO to enforce standards. Uh, because in the world of ILO, uh, at its foundation, that uh, workers should not actually be treated as commodities. In fact, they should be treated as, as human beings. And that there cannot be peace around the world if workers are not able to work in a condition of decency and they are able to also to take care of their families. So clearly speaking, uh, the issue of decent work is at the heart of peace around the world. So clearly speaking, that's why you can see uh, the structure of ILO is something also that is worthy of celebration. Among all the UN agencies, ILO is the only agency that is tripartite in its nature, where decisions are taken through a tripartite process, where government employers or workers uh, will sit down and look at the issue because it's an issue that affects human beings, human life, and human dignity. And that's why even at the inception, that decision was taken. And uh, very profound is also the uh, Philadelphia Declaration uh, of 1946, which said that the issue of inequality and poverty anywhere around the world is actually a threat to prosperity everywhere. So clearly you can see that our founding fathers have thought ahead to use the instrumentality of decent work and social justice to bring about peace around the world. I think that same thought resonates even now as we go into the digital world, as we go into the fourth industrial revolution, that we need to look at work and the condition of workers around the world as something that can also be used to bring about peace. Why do you have migration? Why do people migrate 
from one part of the world to another. Yes, we agree. Migration is an unstable phenomenon, but it should be regulated. Mostly from Africa, we have our able-bodied men and women living the shores of Africa in search of greener pastures. That brings me to President Macron's um, suggestion that um, the European Union should have a universal minimum wage that, cu that cut across um, the EU. Um, what would be your proposition for Nigeria as regards a minimum wage? And if you want to domesticate it, owing to the fact that right now we know that the president has actually um, signed um, the minimum wage bid into law, but uh, some Nigerians are yet to start benefiting from the minimum wage. Yes, uh, as we stand today, more than 90% of the countries of the world have minimum law in place. And they have a procedure of reviewing their minimum wage. Nigeria is one of those countries. As far back as 1981, we have demonstrated Convention 131 that ILO have prescribed to actually look at the issue of minimum wage. We have demonstrated it. And that's why intermittently we have reviewed the minimum wage. What Macron is saying is that even those few countries that don't have minimum wage law, particularly in Europe, his own, he has seen the benefit of minimum wage in bringing about workers from the poverty line level to a level of shared prosperity. And he has seen also how the issue of wage and the issue of workers having decent condition of work have been able to address social upheavals. So I agree with him, and it aligns with the position of ILO that we must have a meaningful wage that workers will be able to sustain their families on. Because if you are working and you cannot be able to take care of your family, then it means you are in the class of what we regard to as working poor. You are working, but yet you are working below the poverty line. And that is what ILO is conversing. And that's why what all the world leaders that have spoken at the convention, they actually gave their commitment. Uh, because we cannot actually undermine the fact that from the First and Second World War, we have had peace. But today, in today's world, today's world is becoming more militarized because of issues of conflict, issues of lack of peace. Even in the most developed economies, you have seen that people that are below the poverty line are actually responding in a very bad manner that is even affecting the prosperity of others. And so they have seen the reason that the thought of ILO to use the issue of decent work to bring about peace and stability around the world is something that is worth considering. And it's empirical. Even the World Bank and IMF have actually also uh, conjured that statement to say that, yes, for us to have shared prosperity and for workers to have a decent work and take care of their families is something that can be used actually to drive the process of peace. So I agree with him and I think his position also agree with the position of ILO. And that's why I think we must call on few countries because we have now, I think, over 90% of countries having, but it that means that we have also countries that have no minimum wage law in place. But even outside having the minimum wage law in place is enforceable. That's the statement he used. He said a minimum wage that can be enforceable, that it should be enforced across the whole of Europe so that all of them would be at par, so that people would not be moving or migrating from one part of Europe to another in search of greener pasture because the condition there is favorable. He has said so that whereas in some countries they have favorable labor laws, favorable condition, especially the Scandinavian countries, in some other countries they are not at par. And because of this then people migrate from their own uh, countries who are having less favorable labor laws to now migrate to countries that has favorable ones. So are you saying that Africa should actually take a cue from what um, President Macron suggested for the EU countries? Certainly, Africa should key into it. Uh, if you look at the issue of migration in itself, you can see that uh, we are using, losing our youthful uh, persons. Not only that, we are also using, losing uh, persons that are actually well trained and educated, but they could not find space or they could not find something to do, and therefore they are forced actually to migrate to other uh, countries. We have seen the story, even back at home, where the stories are so pathetic. So in order to address that, I think it's important that even African leaders and African countries look at what can be used. In Africa today, in many countries, there are conflicts. You can count countries that don't have con conflict or have not experienced conflict. And therefore, we can say clearly that uh, Africa needs even this issue of social protection more than any other country because social protection in Africa is still below 20%. And therefore, social protection is about having people working and then earning a living. 
And not only that, social protection is about also having something in place that workers and citizens can actually uh, rely on, on retirement or on old age. All of these need to be put in place so that we can be able to address issues of social upheaval in our society. So I think that statement is very pro uh, profound. And not only that, uh, it's what Labour have canvassed for over time. And I think it's really uh, very encouraging that world leaders have come here to actually re-echo the same issue that Labour, that they concur with Labour, that those issues are issues. It's not only about profit, because in our countries people celebrate profit. Uh, what, it, it doesn't matter if you have enormous wealth that you cannot impact on your society, that you have enormous wealth that majority of your society are actually poor. Uh, that certainly will not all go well, and that's why the statement still uh, become very relevant that certainly if you have a pool of the working poor and uh, many people cannot take care of family, even the prosperity of the few that are managing uh, our commonwealth will actually be at risk. So clearly speaking, I think that is the way to go. Uh, we need to have social security protection in place for everybody. Uh, we need to have health insurance in place for everybody. We need the children of the poor also to assess quality education. You can only assess quality education if you have the means. Uh, because uh, as we progress, you can also see that unlike before, when we have public schools, public hospitals actually uh, accommodating the interests of everybody. Now, I think also is the fact that uh, those facilities and uh, those favorable conditions are no longer there, or the quality is not the same as it used to be. So we need to invest more on our socials uh, so that citizens uh, can actually have a decent life, especially workers. And I think also because of the fact that the minimum wage have been proven to have a multiplier effect uh, on the larger economy because it actually stimulates economic activities. Once you have a large proportion of the people uh, actually living below the, be, 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 above the poverty line, that actually stimulates a lot of economic activity. So that's the rationale behind it. But capitalists will think otherwise. Uh, they will tell you that uh, workers are uh, actually in a minority. But they forgot that it's this same minority that actually serves the majority. So clearly the thinking here and the thinking out there uh, about how capitalists think is quite different about how we think about sustainable peace and development. Nobody will come into a country where there is no peace. Our economy can only prosper in a situation where there is peace and stability. And therefore how do we ensure peace and stability is to make sure that at least our wealth is not concentrated in the hands of few. Um, a lot has been said about um, workers um, working for more hours because um, the use of internet is on ground is available so we know that many workers actually work for long hours. If you had to dom domesticate this issue in Nigeria, what do you have to say about this development? Um, is there any position that the Nigerian Labour Congress or organized labour is actually trying to achieve to ensure that some um, employers of labour don't abuse workers' rights in terms of working for the minimum hours of eight hours? Yes, uh, the issue of working more than eight hours per day and more than 40 hours per week is actually against the labor law. And back at home, we have this actually uh, provided clearly in our uh, Trade Union Act and then Labor Act. Uh, because the ILO prescribed that uh, a worker, in order to be uh, 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 working under a condition that is decent and uh, not under a precarious condition, should not work more than eight hours per day and that he should not work more than 40 hours uh, per week. Uh, where such a situation happens, it then means it's a precarious work, uh, the work is not decent, and uh, workers can report to their unions, and uh, we can be able to seek, seek uh, for remedy, uh, because it's something that is regulated by law. Uh, because even the concentration of that particular worker after eight hours will actually decline, uh, because of the issue of the diminishing return. Uh, not only that, uh, human beings are not robots, they are not machines. And therefore, a study has been carried out that you can only be effective and productive under uh, this eight-hour working arrangement. And therefore, it's expected that uh, even in uh, workplaces where you run shifts, uh, it's expected that uh, the shift should be able to take into consideration these very clear provisions of the law. Eight hours per day and then uh, 40 hours per week. Where even you run shifts, uh, this is taken into consideration. And where you have over time, it is expected that the worker should be able to negotiate and agree that he should be paid overtime allowance. 
uh, because he has exceeded the normal working time that is allowed by law. So clearly speaking, I think we have taken up that issue back at home. Uh, it's part of our labor law. And uh, anywhere that is abused, uh, unions will be, take, will be uh, taking that up. And uh, workers are free to report to their unions, including the NLC, where such a situation happened, uh, so that we can be able to seek, seek for uh, 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 some sort of uh, uh, relief for, for those workers. But certainly, uh, it's a work that cannot be said to be decent. And that's part of uh, this issue of our source services. Uh, that is part of what, why we are fighting our source services uh, that tend to actually practice this uh, anti-labor and uh, anti-workers uh, practice. And also, uh, in some cases, uh, uh, like uh, uh, precarious works, uh, which they don't respect some of those laws. But clearly speaking, uh, those laws are there in our country. It's also there in the ILO, various ILO convention. It's a global standard that we need to key into it. Uh, we shouldn't treat our people like slaves. It's only slaves that can work without time and uh, that uh, can work at uh, the instance of his master. Uh, we should be able to have an arrangement where workers work and uh, it should be also that they are compensated where they work more than eight hours with their consent. Uh, that's why part of the issue of uh, collective bargaining uh, among the first conventions of ILO is the issue of uh, the right of a worker through his union to collectively bargain his condition of service. So in this case, I think that's why we have tried to ad advise all, for all of our workers to take advantage of uh, this very clear law of uh, freedom of association, which is also demonstrated back at home in uh, Section 40 of the Constitution, that a worker has a right to belong to a trade union of his choice for the purpose of protecting his right and interest. And uh, that's a fundamental and a universal right that ILO have advocated for. Uh, a worker should be able to join the union and then he should be able to report some of those issues to the union where his rights are being trampled upon or where some of those very clear laws are not being respected. So clearly we will be ready to take up uh, that once the complaint is uh, filed with us. Uh, we have a provision to actually follow up with our affiliates unions to be able to address this issue. It was an interesting conversation. Thank you, thank I you, had thank you, year. thank you very much. Thank you. And that's all we can take on today's edition of the program. Join us next week for a fresh edition of the show. I am Sharon Ijason. Thanks for watching, and remember, labor creates wealth.